Okay. Wow, those lights are very bright. Um, and the mirror is really distracting, so it is true what they were saying. So I'll just try and stand this way so I can't see myself. Um, well, thank you all for joining us today uh, and showing interest in, in what we're doing at Blackburn Rose Community Trust to help um, the local community integrate, live and coexist together and hopefully prosper together and lead, lead stronger and better lives and create opportunities for the next generation. I'm Gary Robinson. I'm the Chief Exec of Blackburn Rovers Community Trust. I'm also a member of the football club's senior member of staff, the, the SMT group there. There's six of us and I think that demonstrates how important community is to the football club uh, when they're asking uh, one of the Community Trust staff to sit on the senior management team. Um, this is David Dunwell. He's, he's my deputy. Well, he's the trust deputy. He's a Hello. Hey, Debbie, all right. He's um, a fantastic member of staff. He not only supports on the strategic side of the community trust, but also on the operational side as well. And Dave is going to talk in detail about the operational side of our integration work. Um, so we'll, we'll get cracking. Okay, harnessing the power of football to integrate. As we all know, we all work for football clubs or affiliated organisations and football is such a powerful tool, uh, especially in a country like England. Um, I hope I don't offend anybody when I say this, but in England, football is like a religion to most people. Um, but there are also large communities where football, they haven't been brought up with it, either because they've come from countries mainly around the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where football isn't a part of their main core culture. Um, although it is growing in that region, which is fantastic to see for football. Um, but in Blackburn with Darwin, um, we'll, we'll come on to, to that subject so shortly as to why that's really important. Okay. See, I've got it up on here, but it's not linked to that, so bear with me. Um, yes, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, Blackman Rovers Football Club, I'm not going to assume anybody knows anything about us, although I have to question if you don't know why you know about Blackman Rovers. <laughs> um, we are former Premier League winners. Um, we're going to be talking about the Community Trust as well, about Blackman with Darwin um, as an area of, and as a part of the country. Uh, we're going to talk about inclusion and integration and some of our initiatives around engaging the Muslim community in Blackman, which is a huge, huge um, part of, of the town and also one of our initiatives around a, a street fast, which was quite unique. So yeah, the quick history of Blackburn Rovers, because uh, I know you're not here for a history lesson. Um, so yeah, we're based in the northwest of England. We are within half an hour's drive on a good day from Manchester United, Man City, Liverpool, Everton. So we are kind of at the point of a triangle. So if you imagine Manchester and Liverpool down here, we're, we're right up here in the heart of Lancashire an historic county, um, lots of football clubs in that area. We uh, were a small industrial town, the population is around 150,000, but we do have some boroughs on the outskirts, which is um, contested very strongly, shall we say, by other neighbouring clubs. So we've got Preston North End, nine miles to the west, an established championship club. We've got, I'll whisper it because there are arch rivals, we've got Burnley um, to the east of us, which is a uh, similar distance. And then we're surrounded by Accrington Stanley, United just down the road, etc. So it's really packed of football hotbed in England. Um, we moved to Ewood Park um, in towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, we'd had a couple of homes before that in and around the time, but we, we settled there. And that's our beautiful stadium. Um, ahead of its time, really. But it, I'm glad nobody from the club's here today. But it is starting to be a little <laughs> bit dated, believe it or not, with all the modern technology. Especially when you look at um, Ajax's... Uh, sorry. Um, the Johan Cruyff Arena presentation today. Um, there's a lot more that we need to do on the stadium going forward. Um, capacity is quite a large ground, although we get nowhere near capacity at the moment because we're not. We're doing okay on the pitch, but we're used to being in the Premier League and we've not been there for a long time. Um, so that is impacting on our uh, fan base. And again, then 19 other clubs, um, including five other Premier League clubs. So it is, can be quite competitive from a delivery point of view. Yes, uh, a bit more about the football club. Um, founding member of the Premier League and finding, founding member of the Football League. So that's, there's only two clubs, us and Everton, that have done that. Um, only one of six teams doing the Premier League. 
We've won five um, league winners, six FA Cups. So we're quite, we, we are an established, uh, you know, professional football club in England. And our motto is really important to us, Arte Labore, which means by skill and hard work. We're a working class town. Um, wages aren't the biggest in that part of the world. A lot of it is manual jobs um, in factories, customer service jobs. So, um, you know, the football is a, a big part of life. It's a big outlet in, in our part of the world. And we're owned by the VH Group, or you might better know them as the Venkis Group in India, who bought us in 2010. So our history as a community trust, we operate in this part of Lancashire. So if you zoomed into the northwest, roughly half a million people. Um, again, Darwin, 150,000, Blackmoor, 150,000 people. And quite a large geographical area, but most of it's rural. We've outlined towns and cities. Um, but yeah, we started off as football in the community way back in uh, the late 80s. Football in England had a real so issue in society with hooliganism, drugs, violence, and, and the Professional Football Association decided that football had a role to play because it had an influence. And they formed um, approximately 10 to 12 schemes, and Blackburn Rovers joined that the following year in 87. And we delivered your basic stuff, soccer counts, soccer schools, what I call your core, your core work. So we all get the funding, but the one thing we do control is is the soccer camps, and um, funding comes and goes, but camps will always be there. It's a, core, um, a really important part of our, our work. And then later down the line, uh, we were missing out on uh, funding opportunities because we weren't registered as a charity. So we decided to, uh, the football club decided to separate the, the community department, register it as a charity, um, fully um, registered with the Charities Commission, and that opened up a world of new opportunities for the Trust and Blackburn with Darwin. Again, later on, we adopted the four key themes for how we go about delivering our work, and this is why uh, this slide is on here, that health, sport participation, inclusion, which has also grown into integration, and, and education are exactly how we need to do it. Um, and again, we, uh, later on, you know, following in that decade, we published our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Plan, which was our one rover strategy, which integration falls under. And the club is a big driver behind that. They've bought into it massively. Um, they know that they need to be an inclusive football club for all. And some of the best way to do that is through education. Um, and again, we, we, we as a community trust then launched our five-year strategy, um, which basically puts out there in the public how we go about our work and what we aim to achieve in that period. And obviously the pandemic hit, which caused a lot of issues. But what are we? Um, we're non-traditional. That's why a lot of people come to Blackburn Rovers to help, um, for us to help them implement their strategy and make that a success. So we're non-traditional. You know, we, we offer education programs where, yeah, the local colleges or schools might deliver it, but there's something a little bit different about it when a football club, that little hook, as you'll all know. We're independent, so we're self-financed. The, the football club don't finance us. Uh, we have to raise 100% yes. of our it's own funds, free. and that can be a challenge. <laughs> um, there's a ghost in the room, I think. Um, yeah, and most importantly, and we must never forget this, um, we're a charity. Our, objections, our objectives are to make a big difference in the community, make real-life changes to real-life people, and that's something we never lose focus off. Okay, a little bit more about us. Um, we work with 50,000 people a year, approximately. Our turnover has grown significantly because we diversified our offer, and that five-year strategy has played a huge role in why we've grown from around half a million in 2013 to two million now in, in 2021. We have 100 staff on our books, uh, 45 full-time, and they all have varying skill sets, all come from varying different parts of the community, different ethnicities, religions. We try and be as inclusive as we possibly can. Um, lots, 40 projects, uh, some are really big in depth. Um, some are smaller but large participation, so that the sizes and, and the impacts different, all differ, but they all come back to the four key themes mentioned earlier. And we're really lucky. We're based at the stadium. We have an entire end of the ground, and we've got some outstanding facilities that we've been able to raise funds for and install 
and maintain, which is a very costly thing to do, maintaining um, the facilities that we've got, but they're so important to the local community. Without it, we won't be able to achieve half the change that we've been able to do during that period. And again, um, we've been noted for, for our work and we've recently been voted the Northwest Community Club of the Year by the EFL, which is always nice. So yeah, this is our strategy and the reason why I put that on there, hopefully you can see it, um, maybe we should have cut it into different parts, but I wanted to highlight how important integration and inclusion is in our strategy. So you've probably seen something similar to all of this before. I've seen circular versions of it, I've seen square versions of it, I've seen all sorts. But this is ours, our, ours is a pyramid. We're all working um, upwards and forwards. And the, our vision, mission and values are at the, the top of the heart of what we're doing. And then who we're engaging, why, when, what, where and how, the universal questions, shall we say. But on there, integration is right at the heart of what we do. So I've highlighted in our strategy where integration is, and it is the core. It's the essence of what we do. We are um, a community scheme that is there for everyone. We want everybody in the community to access it, and we want to use the power of football and our facilities and brand to give a level playing field to everybody and the same equal opportunities. And that's our mission statement, again, inspiring change in our community. So integration is some of the most powerful work any community scheme, I believe, can do. And when it's done successfully and when it's done right, which David will, will talk through and give you some examples, hopefully, um, that, for me, it, it says, it epitomises that mission statement. Because when it's done properly, it can have lasting positive change for generations to come. And, and we've started to see that happen within within families and households. So it's integrations at the very heart of what we do and is in our strategy. Okay, there you go, Dave. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna finally kind of narrow down um, a little bit of information around Blackburn with Darwin and hopefully you can then see some similarities in terms of um, potentially areas where you work, there's obviously likely to be some differences as well, but it just allows, hopefully, you to understand some of the challenges we face. Now, it does come across as quite negative because they are the challenges. Uh, obviously, there's some very good things about that we're doing and the areas we work in, but um, <coughs> it's a fairly deprived area. It's the ninth most deprived borough in, in, in uh, England, which means there's, there's poverty, there's deprivation, there's uh, low incomes, etc., etc. I won't go through every single uh, line, but just hopefully you can read those and it helps set the scene. But child poverty is the fifth, fifth highest of any local authority in England. So that's one of the challenges we're facing straight from the off. Health isn't the best either. 67% uh, of the population um, and 31.7% and of year six children are classed as overweight or obese. So we've got some challenges around healthy eating, healthy lifestyles. Um, and in terms of mental health and some other statistics around um, life expectancy and things like that as well, they're quite stark to, to take a look at and read. But the focus of today's kind of presentation is around... Um, uh, oh, sorry, there's a couple more before there around education as well. So 18% of... Um, Adults in Blackburn with Darwin have no recognisable qual qualification, which for me is, is again, an, a, really, a stat that really stands out. Um, so in terms of education and uh, skills, um, the, the, there's a challenge we face there as well, which links into uh, some of our other work. Um, and in terms of the inactivity side of things, which, again, links, links very closely to health, um, there's an interesting stat there around 36.95% of adults are classed as physically inactive. But um, I'd, I've whizzed through those because I want to focus more so on um, inclusion and integration, which is why um, generally I would have thought you guys have come to uh, take a look at this presentation. So um, Blackburn is a very multicultural town um, with 52% of uh, now of primary age children coming from BAME backgrounds. Now, that's really interesting because in the 1960s, that would have been l less than 5%. Through the 80s, that's increased. Uh, th there was a big jump in the 80s and through to the current day. So we've shifted from a big percentage of the town or, or the vast majority being white British to now in 2019, for the first time in primary schools, there's more 
young people from South Asian uh, and ethnic minority groups attending primary schools in the area. So it's a huge change in the population over the last 40, 50 years in Blackburn. Less than 60% of primary age children have English as their first language now, so as in terms of a challenge as well for the schools and for, for, for us as a community trust and what we deliver, we've got a lot of young people that, have, that do speak very good English on the whole, but have it as a second language, so that's still a challenge there. 20% um, of Batman with Darwin's population are considered to have a disability, and 71% of primary schools and 83% of secondary schools are classified as segregated. So that was a really interesting fact. So there's a, there's, there's a bit of an argument around segregation in communities. If you spoke to quite a lot of people in Blackburn with Darwin, they'd say there's no issue. It's a very integrated town and community. But the media and quite a lot of other people within the town would also say there's a lot of segregation. There's certain um, areas of the town that have a really high percentage from one ethnic group and there's others that have a, a really high percentage from another ethnic group and often you don't see as much mixing. So the BBC actually produced a panorama documentary on the segregation within the borough which they titled White Fright Did Divided Britain. So they did this over a 20 year period. They did one one episode of the Panorama programme and then they came back uh, in 2019 and did a follow-up to that to see how things had changed and the way that it was portrayed on the, on, the, on the video was that things hadn't changed very much, in fact segregation had got worse, etc. So, over the last few years, it's been a real focus of us. Just a quick something, that's just to show you how it's portrayed in the press, because I think it's really important to understand how the press put um, integration and segregation across in Blackburn. Here's some headlines for you just to read. Um, some of them are, are fairly shocking. So they, we just picked, uh, the, and from these, in, uh, ITV, BBC, Asian Image, Lancashire Telegraph, these are uh, real kind of article headlines from the last couple of years. And again, it just hopefully paints a bit of a picture of how um, certain people portray the town. So, that being said, the Community Trust have a big role to play in um, integration and inclusion work. So just before I go into the projects themselves, I think it's really important to kind of think about how you term inclusion and integration. So there is a difference between the two. Inclusion is, is saying, you know, you are, you are welcome to everybody, but actually integrating individuals, creating cohesion, creating, helping them understand each other's cultures and values, be creating actual friendships is very different from just including someone. Someone can take part in one of your activities, but it doesn't mean that they're really integrating with you or understanding the people around them. They might just be taking part. So I think that's really important to mention. So a lot of our projects in this area, we look at understanding stereotyping, discrimination, racism. I know show racism, the red card's been mentioned in quite a few presentations. And actually some of the work um, that was talked about on the first day um, was, was interesting and had some, although very different groups, had some very similar um, person kind of crossovers with some of our projects that we're delivering. So we try and understand the impact of segregation. What does that do to a community? What are the risks over a longer term period of that? We want to develop cohesion. We want to promote the strengths of different cultures um, and, and the impact of unity. And we want to support specific groups as well. So um, we have certain projects that in particular are supporting refugee and asylum seeking communities. We've got others that work more closely with the Eastern European communities in the town, um, amongst other things as well. So probably what you're most here to kind of um, understand is what we do at the Community Trust and, and how we've um, invested in changing this. Were you going to do this one? Um, carry on, Dave. You're doing no? a good job. Okay. <laughs> so uh, approximately six years ago, um, Gary and the, and the Board of Trustees agreed to employ an inclusion officer for the first time. Now, the inclusion officer wasn't... Um, funded or linked to a particular project. It was a new role and it was all around focusing on inclusion and integration initiatives, supporting the football club in terms of inclusion and integration, looking internally at our projects, how, how inclusive are our projects, what do they do, um, and 
Um, also, as time's moved on, working a bit more specifically on integration and segregation type projects. So, uh, Ilias, who is this man here, let's see if I can get you off, <laughs> um, is, is our inclusion officer. We now actually have two staff members working full time in this work, which I've put at the bottom there. But Ilias is great, he sp speaks Urdu and Gujarati, which are two um, commonly spoken um, languages in the South Asian community of the town. and um, he, he kind of leads on and delivers some of our um, integration and inclusion initiatives. Sorry, just on that, Dave, um, we, we saw a significant uptake in um, particularly the Indian and Pakistani communities within Blackburn with Darwin once we'd um, employed Ilias. Um, you know, for all the goodwill in the world that we had uh, with my good self or all, a lot of other our white British staff, and, and they did a good job to, to a respect. Having somebody from their own community be a role model um, and be able to talk to them in different languages and understand uh, in a greater detail uh, about their culture than we possibly ever could, because uh, you know, for, for all the goodwill in the world, we're, we're not from that, that particular community. Um, and, and we noticed a, a significant uplift in, in participation. And really, I should have included those stats, but uh, it was a bit of a rush to get this together. <laughs> Sorry, go yeah. on. So um, in so before I move on to com some of our bigger projects, these are just some of the things that, we, uh, that Ilias and others within the team uh, have delivered. So uh, he delivers a program uh, called, anti we call the ARC program, but it's an anti-racism and citizenship program, which is delivered in primary schools. And it's, uh, it kind of looks at stereotyping, looks at discrimination at a very low level and talks about how can you be a good citizen, how can you look after your neighbour, how can you uh, try to understand people's differences. We have um, kick races, amount of football and show racing the red cards, so in terms of match day activities and we host an event every year uh, linked to show racing the red cards, so this, that's one of the images here where we invite players down and get them to talk as well. The golden ticket initiative was a really interesting one, so um, it was around using um, match days as a tool to try and uh, create a new experience and try to tap into some young people that might not have experienced a proper match day before. So we called it the Golden Ticket Initiative. We gave out X number of tickets every single game, which was normally around 15 or 20. We brought a group um, of young people to the ground, normally from a South Asian community or similar, and we gave them an, a, a kind of a special match day experience, behind the scenes, stadium tour, as well as just going into the family stand and watching the game. We took them in some of our family rooms and let them have a go on some of the games. So we made it a, a real full day out for them. Just on that, we probably should thank uh, Willy Wonka for the idea, really. The golden ticket was something we saw in the film and thought it'd be really engaging for the children. It has actually worked really well for us, so thank you, uh, Roald Dahl. The, um, the, the very first project that really looked at segregation and um, inclusion was a pilot project called the Social Mixing Project. Um, and it was, we just did it with one cohort and it kind of informed and guided us into some of our bigger projects that I'll come on to in a minute uh, in this area. So what we essentially did is we, we engaged 15 young people, that's 12 to 15 year olds. We delivered uh, workshops addressing stereotypes, faith and culture activities, studying Blackburn with Darwin um, and, and its communities. And then we also did a Belfast residential. So um, for those who do or don't know, um, Belfast uh, has two very distinct communities. They have a, w a wall that divides the two communities, um, and which is still in place today, and there's a big history. Um, it, that's largely religion-based, but it's also around nationalism. Um, so we took the young people out there to study that and just say, at the extreme end of the spectrum, if segregation text goes to the next level, this is what you could kind of be facing as a worst-case scenario, or potentially worse. So it's really interesting, and it went really well, and moved us on to um, some bigger projects. So Communities United is uh, an adult-based project. We've been delivering it now for three years. Um, and what we essentially do is study race and hate crime. We, we recruit ambassadors from across the community, trying to find people that perhaps would have a further influence after taking part in the program. We, uh, again, explore local heritage and, and develop belonging. Um, and what, what they essentially do is go through this 12-week program. They get to um, 
Uh, and this was predominantly focused on the refugee and asylum seeker community as well, Communities United. Um, and what we did was uh, empowered them to deliver a social action project where they could then try and help further people on their own give it after we'd given them the tools and the education to, to, um, to take that next step. Yeah, sorry, just on that. Um, the social action was uh, designed to be delivered in a different community. So um, the, a lot of the asylum seekers and refugees was going out into the predominantly white British areas, speaking to local people, getting to know them a little bit better and asking them what they would want to see improved in their community and the social action was designed around that. For example, in, in one small area called Cherry Tree, they ended up doing a little garden, uh, tidying up a bit of an area and and that was the first for some of those people from, from Cherry Tree. That, that is the most they interact with somebody from a different culture within the town, even though they might only live two streets away. Um, you know, that, that was well received and the feedback we've got from residents and participants were um, more of this is needed to break down stereotypes and, and some of maybe the, the far right views that, that do exist in the town. Yeah, and what we probably should have mentioned earlier as well when setting the scene was there's about 250 refugee family, families that live in Blackburn now as well, which is quite a big community relative to the size of the town as well. So um, there's, there's a lot of people in that group that we also work with regularly. So Communities United is one programme. Community Ambassadors is another programme um, which is probably even bigger in scale. It, for this programme, it's a 12-week long programme Interestingly, we do DNA testing on this program. So mm. on the first week, the participants get to have the DNA tested. And a bit like, who do you, who do you think you are, if anybody's seen that on, uh, on the BBC? Um, they get to find out, in terms of their heritage, what, what makeup they are. So a lot of people from Blackburn think they're fully English, always yeah. have been English blood, when actually when the DNA results come back, they're... 40% African, 30% Jamaican, 20% English. And then Avian was a good cetera, one, wasn't it? Et uh, it varies depending person to person, but often people are surprised by what comes back. Sorry, just on that, Dave, the difference that makes is the, the participants who have maybe had some more extreme views, shall we say, um, from the white British community, it, you can see the change on the face as soon as they read those results and realise that they, they're not descended straight from King George. It... it it really is an eye-opener for them that they have a lot in common from, from people who they may have had um, not so nice views about just because of the, the, the way they look or what religion they might, um, you know, um, practice. So um, if only I could have captured that on video, but it's a very private, intimate thing wh when the unveiling of where their ancestors come from. So we, we never filmed that bit. But the, the look on their faces when they find out they're partially Scandinavian or they've come from the Middle East is... Uh, it does make a difference to them. They do. It's like a light bulb moment for some of them. And um, obviously, as a charity, we're, we're also judged on the impact and the change. What, what are we doing that, that is making a difference? And, and that, instead of it being a mass participation event, which we all do, changing that one individual's outlook on what his, his or her national views are was just as impactful as some of our other work. So, yeah, th this is some of our more powerful work that we've done. Yeah, and, and this project is, is designed to target community leaders, either officially or unofficially. So unofficially might be just individuals who have a large kind of voice in their said communities, whether that be a good voice or a bad voice with sometimes semi-extremist views as well, and, and looking to engage those kind of people. Again, we do a Belfast residential um, to study that integration, and, and, and but this time it's challenging adults. Instead of keeping talking about it, I think we've got a quick video here that hopefully set the scene a little bit. So if this looks at the Belfast residential itself. I've taken a lot out of it personally, and I'm sure the group have. It's been great to see the group mix from the start of yesterday, and we did the bus tour yesterday.
I like the fact that we did the boss tour twice accidentally because stuff that you might not have picked up on yesterday you're definitely picking up on today. This is Chloe, she's now actually a member of staff. There was definitely parts that came out a bit more than yesterday because of the different tour guides. So today we went to, I believe, one of the six main parts of the Peace Wall. We were in a section which I believe is pretty new and not been on before that shows other walls, famous walls around the world. Okay, um, so <clears throat> this is just the leader of the council, Councillor Mohammed Khan, and, and a quote he made around the Community Ambassadors Programme and the value that they felt it had in the community. So hopefully you saw from the video, it's the, part of the project is just around getting a group of people, putting them into some fun, meaningful activities and allowing them to mix and genuinely co uh, create some cohesion. Another part is that educational piece uh, that's a, a little bit more in depth. Um, we also have the equivalent program, but for young people. Uh, so it's a slightly short, shorter program, but um, essentially what we do is we, we cr um, recruit young people from across the borough, uh, from different schools, different backgrounds, and deliver a very similar program that, that studies integration within Blackburn with Darwin, looks at positive social mixing, uh, explores and celebrates identities. They do a cultural trail around the town, so they visit a mosque, the, the cathedral, and, uh, and other prominent p uh, points from a cultural point of view and a religious point of view. Um, and, and they taste different world foods, which they love doing that, so they get to they get different bits of food from I'm around sure the world. you turned up for that session, didn't you, Dave? I did, every um, single one. Oh, just on that, there is, uh, I, <laughs> I missed it, I was on holiday. Um, yeah, the young ambassadors, the youth ambassadors ones, a really important project for us because, you know, unfortunately some, some young people are vulnerable uh, to being recruited uh, from far-right organisations that, um, you know, prey on uh, deprivation, prey on inequality. They then create a narrative to um, exploit uh, or, or reasons to blame uh, why they're, they're living in poverty that aren't necessarily true. So the Youth Ambassadors one, like I say, is a really important one for us to get young people on that programme, you know, mixing socially outside of their, their communities um, and seeing that people who look different uh, than yourself aren't necessarily the reasons for the problems in your life. So it's been a huge success for us. That programme has been refunded for a further two years, given the success of it. I'm going to play a quick video. I'll, I will cut it short because we're running a little bit tight for time. We've got a little bit more stuff we want to cover. Yeah, we started late as well, didn't we? Hi, my name is Moria and I'm 14. Hi, my name is Anna. Hi, my name is Moria and I'm 14. Hi, my name is Zainab and I'm 15 and I joined Youth Ambassador to help our community come together. We learned that not everyone talks to everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, everyone should talk to everyone, but they don't because there is segregation, whether you want to believe in it or not. There was a lot of people that didn't talk to each other because of how they were, who they were, they were quite people. But now, as we've progressed through this, we all come together, whether you're shy or not, we all come together. 
during our experience, we learned many new things, like how to talk to new people, how to learn about a like, new skill. You don't really know, like you can learn new things over the level. It's been like a really fun time, and we've met a lot of new people, and we've been doing a lot of new activities, and it's been really fun. During the weeks, we all like want to talk to each other and get closer to them and get to know each other. We also need to learn new skills and get to know each other more and see what it's all about. During the eight weeks that we had over here, we had a residential and over there we did quite a lot of activities and it was hard but in the end we did all get together, we did all talk and try and do it. During the residential we had like a sub, we had different team bonding games and we learned a lot about people that we've always known like for a long time but we've never really spoken to. We had to build things higher and higher. We had to work as a team and we couldn't do it alone. But as we got higher we built more confidence. Yeah. And it just shows that if you're together as a team, then you can actually work better together instead of being on your own. Along with like past few weeks we've learned that we're, we're all so different, but at the same time we're very similar and we need to come together and not like have any barriers between us because of different beliefs and different cultures and different races. The whole point of the Youth Abata is to put a stop to the like, diversion of community and um, come together and promote social integration. I joined to change the community for a better place. Hi, I'm Simeon and I am from St. Walford. I joined to make Blackburn a nicer place. As today's programme of stories from the record, I want to do the same and want to change the community for the foreseeable future. Build a team together and support one another. My name's Howie Gale, and I'm a, I'm a former player here at Blackburn Rovers. I'm Councillor Laurie Bateson. I'm an executive member for Children, but I do my job. Um, it's difficult, but I want to make a difference, particularly for young people. Don't count the days, make the days count. different settings and this is a typical example of where we are today. I think young people are brilliant at bringing themselves together. Together we can make our voices heard. Our town, our team. Our town, our team. Our town, our team. Yeah, I should have also mentioned that um, unfortunately, Blackburn with Darwin is an area where uh, religious extremists recruit young people from as well. There's, there's been several high-profile um, cases where young people, mainly from the Asian community, have been arrested for terrorism-related offences. Uh, one was linked to one in Australia a few years ago where uh, a young boy recruit from Blackburn remotely recruited somebody else in Australia to, to try and carry out an attack. So this programme brings different communities together, those who are vulnerable to, to opposing views, getting them mixing together, finding out that they're not very different, even though they might have certain differences. And um, football is an important tool in that because every single one of your young people have different levels of love for the club or love for football, but it's, it's just enough to get them all to be involved. So that's the, the power of football um, displayed on the Youth Ambassador Project. Okay. We can't do this on our own. The football club um, hugely believes in um, integration and the club being available for everyone. Uh, the football club themselves um, have employed a, a full-time officer, uh, mainly around the business engagement with the Asian communities, but that's grown massively to, to support the work that we do and complement that. And we've created a multi-faith prayer room, one of the first in football, um, and we often tweet about that, showing people from different religions praying, um, and that's gone viral, and that's helped us to 
um, you know, from a commercial perspective, become more inclusive. Ticket sales from that community have increased, but it um, helps the community trust, helps the local community to achieve its objectives by being a more harmonious place to live. Um, yeah, recently we've introduced halal food on the concourse. It's very popular, and we've done alcohol-free free zones as well, uh, particularly related to the family areas. Um, we've also had partnerships with, with other um, BME organisations within the town that have been key influence for us. So we've brought in religious leaders and elders fr from all different communities, um, mosque leaders, to, to come in and support that work that do, and, and they become ambassadors for us. Um, and again, <coughs> we, we support all the main um, holidays from all different types of religions, and that's helped bring um, you know, the community closer together using football as that, that vehicle. Other work we've done as well, uh, we run the National Citizen Service, which is a social inclusion program for, for young people. Uh, we work with around 300 young people a year. We take them away on a residential, mixing them from all the different communities. They do the outbound activities, team building, water sports, etc. And then they work together for a week to create a social action project. And they go and do some volunteering in the community, um, in each other's different communities as well. Plus Dave heads up a program called the Neighbourhood Youth Offer um, and we have 33 unique sessions a week attended by over 2,000 young people from all the different communities and a lot of them do like staying in their own neighbourhoods but um, we regularly, at least quarterly, bring them together for um, community tournaments etc which has been a huge, huge advantage uh, to our work, it's definitely added value and again all our schools work from primary schools to high schools we employ uh, 12 full-time staff to work in the primary schools, supporting the teachers with education, integration being a key one. Um, and again, 42% of the children have English as a second language, so we, we come in, some of our staff speak multiple languages, and, and that helps um, with the integration. Um, there we go, one last video for you. Hopefully this one isn't too long. There's no sound on this. And is I think that made us quite close. Cornwall was this the one who's gone talk to anybody. Way. Whereas I was bubbly, but I was shy at the same time. She brought out confidence <laughs> in me to just speak to people. My friendship with Cornwall has changed me because I'm definitely not shy to share my opinion anymore. I'm kind of like that now as well. It helped a lot that I got to have an experience in that with NCS. Shannon is very welcoming. If you're a complete stranger, she can make you feel like you're her best friend and like you've known her forever. It's very important to have Cornwall in my life because she's fun, very outgoing. She's definitely a character. She's very caring. Living in Blackburn's very, it's very segregated. I think there's definitely a white community and an Asian community. I certainly wouldn't have met Cornwall if it hadn't been for NCS. Yeah, I agree with that, we wouldn't. I think it's very important to meet people from different backgrounds. You can learn so much from each other that maybe you wouldn't learn from just your community. So it was nice for me and Cornwall to bond over something different that's not our religion. We just have a laugh. Like it's okay to be silly. <laughs> I went to uni in Brighton and I study architecture. When I got to uni, I realised after being with Shannon in the NTS, it was exactly what I needed because I could speak to people with more confidence. When she moved away, it was instead of meeting up nearly every day, it was phone calls, Snapchat, FaceTime. There's no stopping us while we start talking. We do need to talk every day, otherwise I think we'd get like withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> yeah. When you're on NCS, you're not thinking about, oh, where did this person come from? You're just in the moment <coughs> with each other. Yeah, you're just there to create life, changing friendships. That's just another example, and that's just one <coughs> story. Um, there's countless more who have had a little bit of an interest in football, seen, seen us promoting the activities or have been on a different project with us. And um, that's a, a really good example of bringing different communities together through the power of football. Um, yeah, I think we've got uh, one more initiative, that because um, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, again, part of our strategy is to... Um, 
promote uh, inclusivity through uh, religious activities and there's no better way than supporting the main holidays for, for different religions and Ramadan is such an important time um, in the Islamic community so we decided to create a little project around that and uh, some of the graduates from some of our programs that you've heard today um, wanted to do some volunteering and they created this project which we helped to fund and resource but essentially the participants from from youth ambassadors community ambassadors communities united um created um this initiative where there's a multicultural street uh, many different uh, households live live um uh, from different religions in darwin and so we picked this street uh, never having worked on there before they did some research and they went and knocked on people's doors and said are you aware that who your neighbours are and not really they wasn't they'd, they'd seen and passed they'd never really had a conversation with each other so we decided to do on Ramadan uh, 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 this initiative and hopefully I'll let, I'll let the video do the talking It's quarter past three. In the morning. Just <laughs> eating our breakfast. <laughs> what are you having? Some cereal and some toast. <laughs> I didn't think I'd find it this hard not eating or drinking all day. Uh, I found it hard eating in the morning that early. It is an insight. It's quite eye-opening to, to understand what they go through for a, for a full month. We're only doing it for a day, do you know what I mean? And we're finding it hard. These are the, uh, the food hampers for, for the families who are taking part in the, um, the fast as well. We build on community unity. <coughs> That's what we want. Um, people may have different faiths, different beliefs, but we all live together. And if we want to have a model community, which is our goal, The street fast, will, I think, will hopefully show that to people that, you know, people do live side by side, can have different religions, different, um, you know, hobbies, whatever it might be, and we can coexist together and, and actually thrive together and, and appreciate and value each other's differences and see that as a strength. Cheers, thank you. Everyone's getting involved, especially because, <coughs> you know, um, they, I think Blackburn Rovers, they do a lot of for Christmas time, so it's nice to do something for like Ramadan and Eid to get everyone involved. I think it's a lovely way to bring the community together, raise awareness for Ramadan. Oh. You right, you right, okay. As promised. Oh, thank you so gone. much, thank you. You can now have your dates and water. Not really keen on these, but mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's it from ourselves. Hopefully you found that interesting and useful. The, I must admit there, were, there was a lot um, on that, a lot of different initiatives, but it's such an important area. Of all the companies on the Fortune five hundred again that that ghost again, haunted this place. Um, so yeah, it's such an important um, subject to us. It's right at the heart of what we do, what we believe in, and um, that's why we've invested a significant amount of resources that we've raised um, into supporting integration, inclusion, and cohesion, and understanding the differences. And you know, it's got to be, it's got to remain right at the front of our strategy for the next f hopefully five, ten years. Um, in an ideal world, we wouldn't need to do this, um, but we do deal in the real world and there is a need for our work, there is a need for football to uh, play its role in society, to bring people together, appreciate differences and uh, to coexist and football is a great hook for that and hopefully you'll all see that in your work, maybe not around this particular field, but you'll see the difference that football makes. So thank you very much for your time and, and joining us today. Uh, Happy to answer any questions if anybody's got any questions. Um, if we are, we are a little bit late. If you're ready for a break, you can just grab us separately if you want yeah, over a coffee. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much.